Good morning, and welcome to the Chamber's second webinar of a three-part Small Business Recovery and Resilience Series webinar series, brought to you here by the Long Beach Area Chamber of Commerce and many, many of our sponsors and members that we'll get to here in a moment. My name is Jeremy Harris. I'm the President and CEO of the Long Beach Area Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be your virtual MC uh, this morning as we listen to a couple of great panelists and we talk about small business recovery and resiliency here in Long Beach and the surrounding communities. We have an excellent informative webinar to get you all excited about today. Again, a couple of wonderful panelists to discuss how they pivoted and changed here in the past year and what they're doing as we move forward. We've all been through some challenging times. I know we're looking forward to brighter days uh, very, very soon, especially with the most recent news of about how the economy will be reopening here shortly um, as June approaches. Before we begin, we're gonna go over some brief housekeeping items um, for the presentation today. We wanna to encourage everyone to use the Q&A feature, which can be found typically at the bottom of your screen in the icon bar. We'll save all the questions at the end of each presentation, but as the presentation unfolds, please feel free to ask them along the way. If you wanna know more about the membership in the chamber, of course, please feel free to reach out to us in the chat box and someone from our team will get back to you. Please note this webinar will be recorded and distributed to all registrants and chamber members. If you have additional questions after the webinar, you can reach out to Amanda Donahue in our office. She'll help uh, provide that information back to you. The Small Business Recovery and Resiliency Series will also take place and conclude next Thursday, April 15th, and that will complete the series. This program has and will be the the program to help identify strategies and practices for supporting small businesses and then also others through the recovery process. I've been really excited that we've been able to present this series, but we can only do it because of those panelists who have volunteered their time to do so. And of course, many of the sponsors and the chamber members here in Long Beach. A portion of each sponsorship of this series will be going directly to a local small business who wasn't able to afford their membership during the pandemic. So with that, it's a big hearty uh, thanks to all of our sponsors and I'll get to here in a moment. We're gonna be excited to announce next week at the conclusion of our webinar series, exactly how many of those small businesses that we were able to save uh, for their membership so we can continue to provide those valuable services to them. So with that being said, we owe a big thank you to the series sponsor, Don Temple Storage. Uh, they have been instrumental in providing this series along with a whole host of other things that the chamber is doing. So special thanks to Summer and her team at Dawn Temple Storage for being the series sponsor. Another big thank you to our top sponsors, SoCal Gas, Valero, Watson Land Company, and Dignity Health St. Mary Medical Center. Without them, we can, couldn't do it without you. And of course, our panelists today, a couple of uh, new sponsors that joined the series, and you'll be hearing from them today, Primal Alchemy, thank you so much. And of course, Cora Events, Ryan Cora. Thank you again for being here this morning. Now let's move into today's program and we'll start with our first presenter, Dana Buchanan. I know she's essentially no stranger to many of you in the Long Beach area and the Long Beach community. She's the co-founder along with her partner, Chef Paul Buchanan of Primal Alchemy Catering and Events, a full service catering firm specializing in seasonal, sustainable and local cuisine. As the first state certified green business in Long Beach and the only caterer in Southern California Primal Alchemy has enjoyed making memories and marking milestones for corporate and social clients for 20 years. Prior to the pandemic, they've enjoyed working with corporate clients such as the TED Conference, both the Port and the City of Long Beach, Millennium Healthcare, Chipotle, Quicksilver, Matson, Rip Curl, just to name a few. They've also partnered with many of the nonprofits that we all know, such as Pathways, Rancho Los Alamitos, Cabrillo, the Aquarium, Guidance Center, and many, many others. In addition to many social events, birthdays, anniversaries, life celebrations, and weddings. They do it all. Dana is, involved, is an involved member, excuse me, in the Long Beach community, serving as the commissioner for the city on the board of the California Conference for Equ Equality and Justice, known as CCEJ, and of course, the Long Beach Rotary Club. It's a graduate of both the Long Beach, uh, Leadership Long Beach and the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. She has become a regular fixture on Clubhouse. And if you don't know what that is, make sure you ask her. She's led her team with creativity, innovation, and risk-taking uh, what it's required to do, not only to survive, but thrive this past year after losing 100% of their business on March 13th of 2020. Her team is constantly moving with the speed and tenacity to 
accomplish that pivot and after pivot and another pivot, trusting and implementing on the fly. Dana will be presenting what this past year has been like and will hopefully give you a little taste of what it's been like to stay a step ahead of the unknown and following the adage, when life puts you in tough situations, don't say why me, say try me. With that, my good friend, Dana Buchanan. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm gonna share my screen now so you can all see what the last year for me has been like. Where is it? Now I'll go back to Zoom. Sorry. It's okay. Thanks. I'm gonna go share. I had this all and set. Here up. it is. Oh, oh there it is. Yeah. Okay. Share. Then you'll need to right in there. Solutions. Okay. Can you see that now? We're good? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we we were a full service catering firm, uh, enjoying doing many events that looked like these for a lot of years. And then this happened. <laughs> we were in, uh, Chef Paul and I were in Las Vegas at a catering convention attended by catering business owners from all over the country. Uh, it was on Monday, the Monday before March 13th, it started. And here we are celebrating with friends and we share best practices. It's a basically a conference. And uh, that was on Monday. By Friday, by Thursday, the last day of the conference that week, uh, we had been getting texts and calls from all our offices back home, from our staff saying that events were being canceled over and over and over again. So literally by the end of the week on Thursday, there was people in tears in the hallways thinking that they've completely lost their business. So that was the start of that. Uh, everything pretty much on March 13th just went away, disappeared. 100% of our business lost. So uh, this slide is for those of you who are in the food industry out there. You know, only one person is allowed to cry in the walk-in at one time. So Paul and I had had a decision to make. Either we could let it beat us or we could go for it and and try to make it work so on friday when we drove home from las vegas we developed what we called our four hour drive business plan we came up with a name for our pivot we designed menus processes and everything we needed to implement what was called the primal provisions division of our of our business so basically it's, uh, we, and then we met with our team on Monday morning. So this is Friday. We met with our team on Monday. We, over the weekend, we developed it. And we shared with our team what our vision was for how we were gonna move forward during the shutdown. And we came up with this motto that done is, well, we didn't come up with it. It was basically, um, it's been out there, but done is better than perfect and decided to, have them help us implement provisions pantry. Uh, we got to um, figure out how to do online ordering. This is our order form and how to deliver and all everything that went into it. Our team jumped on it in a big way so that by the time we uh, launched it on Monday, we had the order form up online with e-commerce and we made our first delivery and pickup on Thursday, March, I think it was March 17th or 18th. So it was a five day quick turnaround pivot we were able to implement. This is what it looked like. Uh, fresh, healthy family meals packaged beautifully delivered to your home or pick up at our pantry, which I'll get into in a minute. I know this is probably making you hungry. That's one of our entrees. So basically it was like bringing a restaurant to your home. We knew people weren't gonna be able to get out. So we brought gourmet food to you. One of the components that we wanted from the beginning, it was, was a charity component to it. 
we know that nonprofits completely lost their ability to raise money through galas and things like that they used to do. So we, we designed charity into our, our pivot. We gave all our delivery fees each month to a different charity. So we were able to cut some pretty nice checks to, uh, here we have Friends of Pathways, Children Today, Long Beach Rotary Club, JCC, and many others we were able to cut checks to as we were going along. And this is, this is one of my favorite parts of our pivot, by the way. One of the things we also did was take some of our favorite products that our clients have enjoyed over the years and, and package them for retail sale. So uh, we did pickled items, jams, salad in a jar, charcuterie, all those things that our clients have known and loved us for over the years. And we packaged those up to be able to sell them retail. And people loved it. The other thing we did was um, pivoted our, we're lucky enough to have a kitchen by the sea. We literally are on the bike path in the Belmont Pier Plaza. So we, on the left is the picture of the first day we had delivery and pickups happening, our little table out there. And it morphed into the picture on your right where there's Chef Paul there. We had, you know, all kinds of things you could get with uh, prepared foods and our pantry items and things like that. It was really, really fun. Uh, to do that. And here you have on our left, it morphed into a literal tiny farmer's market uh, and people just loved it. We had farmer friends of ours supply us with fresh produce and all our pantry items out there. We had people coming all the time and there's a councilwoman, Susie Price on the right, picking up her bag of goodies. And then we needed to expand further because people were asking us and the Burrito Bel Air was born. <laughs> Um, seriously, we started making what we call bodacious breakfast burritos. And um, no, they're not that big, but they are big. And we actually have quite the cult following of people that come every Sunday morning to get their breakfast burritos from our little pantry out front. We also developed other menu items that we started doing, burgers, pastries, all kinds of uh, drink mixers in the upper middle there that we that we have for sale. All this is available online too, most of the pantry items. Uh, so they can grab and go Friday evenings and weekends. The next thing we did um, was do themed pop-ups in front of our, our pantry. So this is Blair Cohen's fault. He said to me one day, you know what I really miss? I miss Dole Whip at the Orange, at the Orange County Fair. And I thought, you know what? There's so many people that can't go to these things anymore. The fairs were closed. So instead of going to the fair, we brought the fair to you. So we created this fun zone food fair and we had all the favorites, tater tots, turkey legs, corn dogs. Uh, there's Jeremy and his family enjoying it. And we made it just a really fun way for people to get out of the house, bring their families out and enjoy doing stuff together again in a very safe way. We also, uh, expanded that to other festivals. So we had Oktoberfest, we had a photo booth there. Uh, people just really had a good time eating Oktoberfest food. Super, super fun. We also uh, came up with a way to bring holidays to you. We started doing themed dinners, family feasts, if you will, that were centered around holidays like Easter. This is the Easter we just did. We did Mother's Day and we're doing Mother's Day coming up again. If you wanna order for that, it's not too late. The order form is going up next week. Uh, we did 4th of July, Father's Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, all the holidays you could order from us and have a beautiful gourmet meal in your own home. Uh, we, when we realized we were gonna be in it for the long haul, we uh, knew we had to do more than just what we were doing at the pantry and provisions. So we applied for the Great Plates program, which we've been doing since October, feeding seniors to the Great Plates program through LA County. And we also uh, have been doing the feeding LGBTQ seniors through the CARES Act to the city of Long Beach. So that's been really fun and rewarding to participate in that. Uh, one of the things that we had to learn in our pivot was the logistics of delivery and shipping food because we, being a, a caterer for large events, we were used to loading trucks and 
going out to the event, bringing the trucks back and unloading. We weren't used to what it takes to do delivery to individual homes and corporations and things like that throughout the Southland. So we had to figure that the logistics of that out. Uh, one of the things that we really, really have been having a blast with is doing gourmet boxed meals for different uh, entities. So we developed a way to add a meal layer to people's Zoom meetings and online galas and things like that. The, this is one project that we did. That is the meal on the left. It's kind of a surf and turf with for homemade focaccia and, and a salad and dips and things like that. So that went into a box that also incorporated the program, a little thank you card, the wines that were donated that we incorporated. And then we packed them. I had, this is 250 deliveries we had all over the Southland. That's me organizing them to have my, my 10 to 15 delivery drivers pick them all up and get them all out uh, fresh and ready. And the guests were able to heat things up and sit down and have a glass of wine and enjoy their gala with their 250 other attendees. This is a really fun one we did. This is Intertrend. It's a local business here in Long Beach. They have a brunch they do every year and as, as kind of an employee thank you, and they couldn't do that. So they hired us to put together a brunch kit that we then shipped and delivered all over, uh, out of state even. And they had instructions. They made it really fun. They put it all together so that when they sat down and had their, their brunch meeting, they were able to really enjoy each other's company and really bond. And it was hilarious because they were so competitive. They, these are some of the pictures up here of what they did uh, for plating and things like that. It was really fun. And Julia, the, the owner, really was super pleased with how it came out and everybody really loved it. Another one we did was for a, a nationwide bank. We were able to put together, they had a, wanted to celebrate Black History Month and corporate diversity. And they, they had three uh, employees, people of color that had recipes they wanted to share and have a cooking class online with um, the story of why those recipes were important to them. So we were able to put together this kit and send that all over the country so they could get online and do that. So that was really rewarding. Uh, and, and we did boxes for birthdays, for anniversaries. The upper left is a box we did for a local luxury car manufacturer when they launched their new line. Um, it was lobster. You know, box, box, boxes don't have to be, you know, foot-long subs. They can be beautiful lobster salads and things like that. So we really had fun putting together a lot of boxes for people for all kinds of things. Board meetings, you know, whoever, whoever needed a group online to, to share that experience of food with each other. Uh, we had other fun things that we did. To, on the left, we have our charcuterie box. Uh, we, I don't know if anybody's aware, we make our own charcuterie in-house. This is a box that we put together. People would buy these and go have picnics outdoors or send them to, to clients or people that, friends that they wanted to cheer up. Uh, the lower middle picture is cooking classes that Paul would do. So we had fun doing some of those. We put together gift baskets for people to send other people. We call them baskets or bags of cheer to send out. That's the lower right. On the upper right is a wedding that we did. Uh, you know, people were able to have wedding ceremonies, but not receptions. So we put together food bag kits of nice meals for people to take home with them after the ceremony. And the center, upper center is a styled shoot that we did of one of our grazing tables. We took advantage of our some of the downtime to put together some new marketing materials and things like that through styled shoots and things. This is something that we were really looking forward to doing. We were supposed to do a big event on top of the launch, the, the introduction of the Gerald Desmond Bridge. We weren't able to do that, but we were able to still provide breakfast burritos for the trucks drivers that, that drove across, the first trucks that drove across the bridge and box lunches for the folks that were the crew putting the whole online program together. They did a great job. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was, it was pretty amazing. So we really had fun doing that. Uh, one of the other pivots we did, which we are still doing, is we took our pantry items, as you can see on the left, the uh, cheese, charcuterie, and dips, and things like that, and we are now available retail 
through the wine country. You can find our products there. Uh, they've been carrying them since about November and brand new. We just launched into the high low market, which is on the bottom floor of the first current tower downtown and some of their other locations. And we have several others we're talking to. So you can find our food uh, other than the pantry in front of our kitchen in retail stores now. So that was another pivot. And as we were doing all of that, and some of you may relate to this, we were attempting to navigate the crazy insanity of PPP grants and loans and things like that. It was, it, it was and continues to be very stressful and, and uh, um, just something that, you know, who knew, who knew you were gonna be doing this kind of thing. So, uh, but I do have to say that the SBDC uh, here over at the City College campus and the um, Long Beach Chamber were instrumental in helping provide resources and things like that for us to access. So that made it a little bit easier, but it's still been super, super crazy. Uh, I just wanted to mention a little bit about what kind of impact, economic impact the events industry in California has. There's 3 million jobs, but I think that's more, I think that's a little bit low. I think it's more like seven to 10 million jobs. It's a $40 billion industry statewide and 7 billion, about 7 billion of that is in weddings. So this is not a little podunk industry. You know, it's, it's, it's a massive, massive economic impact. And I'm telling you this because uh, there's still a lot of frustration happening in, in our industry because we were the first to shut down and we're the last to reopen. And that's because we have not really been given guidelines. Uh, you know, there's been guidelines for restaurants and hotels and stadiums and Disneyland and things like that. But we're, we're the industry that does venues, beaches, barns, private homes. Our events are not part of that. Those other uh, entities that have voices and they have lobbyists and things like that to go to Sacramento and lobby for them. So we formed a, a, a group called the California Events Coalition that represented us fam more family owned businesses orient that are oriented more family owned to go and use our voice. And last Friday, they finally released guidelines or the beginning of guidelines for reopening for events. And it was very good news. The guidelines are still to come, but we're looking forward to that. And I think that to let you know that the ripple effect of so many businesses that are involved in the event business, not just catering, not just Ryan's, Ryan does uh, with rentals, but photographers, makeup artists, videographers, it's just endless the number of industries that have been affected by, by this shutdown and trying to um, do what they can to stay alive and, and, and be there when this all opens back up. So uh, we started this last year with a desperate motto of, we're just trying to save our business and survive this whole thing. Like it was all about survival. And as we pivoted and adapted, we quickly switched to a new paradigm of we're having a blast, creating our new normal and thriving. Sometimes you just have to keep moving forward even if the path isn't clear. It's been a lot of hard work and we are thriving and looking forward to some fun new ideas to serve our community. And of course, seeing all of you at events again. So in closing, when giving back becomes getting back, it's a support from our community that allowed us to survive this last year and thrive moving forward. So thank you for hearing our story. And if we have time, I'd like to take a couple of questions. Dana, great job. Appreciate that overview. And I, I think you you touched on some real salient points that you know a, a lot of folks are you know focused on on restaurants um, and rightfully so. Um, but I think sometimes we forget all about the event sector or the the, you know, where you fall in with catering and the experience you provide to those folks having fun at those events. And I know both you and Ryan will talk um, and have talked a lot about that. So I want to just say thank you. And, and uh, thanks for the, the shameless plug there in, in terms of what we've done to help small business. You know, that's what we're here thank for. And, and that was a nice little surprise with the, uh, the picture of, of the family too. So you've done <laughs> a wonderful job. So please keep it up. We've got time for a couple of questions. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, use that Q&A feature at the, the bottom of your screen. And, um, and I've got a couple here, we'll, we'll go ahead and kick off. You know, you, you talked about that drive home from Vegas and how you said, okay, what is our new business model and business plan gonna be? And you created, um, you know, uh, provisions pantry essentially. Let's, let's assume, you know, June 15th has, has been announced here in California where, you know, the, 
the health orders, um, why still masking is going to be required, but essentially the, that tiered system all goes away and we can get back to normal, as they say. Um, what, are you, what are your plans with your new business model that you've got? Are you, you going to take that back? Are you still moving it forward? Are you going back to just events only? want to care to uh yeah uh i think i know that the um the wholesale placing products into retail stores is going to stay and we are working on right now a, a menu uh, menus for a meal subscription plan we've had so many people that have been recipients of our individual for seniors especially things like that or people that just want to eat healthy um one of our great plates uh clients her doctor actually told her, asked her, what have you been doing? Because her labs, or she's had some issues and her labs came back recently, were crazy different and much improved from what they were before she started eating her food. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of a good testimonial, but so, so yeah, we probably will be doing a menu subscription plan. Um, we've had lots of requests for that, but also um, moving forward, events are not just gonna blow back open. There's a lot, we don't have our guidelines yet. We have capacity recommendations, but we don't have guidelines yet. And from what I'm hearing, as I'm on these chat rooms and things all over the country, we don't know where the liability is gonna lie. So the liability could lie with the venue, it could lie with the, could, it could lie with the, with the planners. So there's a lot of still unknowns. And then there's just fear, the, the fear that's been instilled in the public for the last year. How many people are really gonna get out there and show up for events? I think, there's going to be hybrid, um, other than like big festival like Ryan does at Coachella and things like that. Uh, that'll probably go go off crazy, but um, I think there's going to be a hybrid approach to things like nonprofit galas and things like that, so that people can attend in person or choose to stay home if they want. And or it also opens up a huge uh, ability to be able to reach a bigger audience online. A lot of nonprofits I've talked to have made more money. Uh, in, in donations because they're able to bring in people from New York if they want to attend, even though they're a local charity. So it's just, it's just completely shifted everything. It's, it's not going to, it's, it's, I, but I think it's for the better almost. So it's kind of a weird, a weird thing that, that it could be for the better through all this, but yeah. I, I guess once you've adapted and you kind of got used to it, then yeah, you can say it's for the better because now you, you'd be like, okay, we, we had a plan. We stuck to that plan. The plan worked. And and now you talk a lot about the hybrid event model. Yeah. Certainly something the chamber is looking at. You know, we can't wait to get back to in-person, but we also know there's going to be a segment of our membership that likes the online or wants to have at least access to the online. So yeah, you don't even have to put on pants, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't give away our secret here today. <laughs> um, another question that's popped up here um, is um, many of us know that you and Chef Paul founded Primal Alchemy um, on sustainability. You know, that that's important to your business. How did the pandemic um, impact that or affect it at all? Well, I don't think I need to, I, I don't think it's any secret that styrofoam is back in town and um, it's really got me riled up. Uh, there's no reason why we can't maintain sustainability through this, but it kind of just went out the window with a lot of other, um, you know, rules, <laughs> rules and regulations. So, I mean, who knew we were going to be able to have alcohol to go, right? I mean, that's right. kind of, so I think that that it's going to remain a forefront of our business. And I, I really wish that um, people would, would keep that in mind still uh, moving forward. But yeah, it's been a huge impact. Packaging, how, I mean, everybody was eating to go. So all the packaging, they went into that. We never changed our, our ethos. We still have everything we did or and are doing for all these box things and all that is totally biodegradable, recyclable. Um, I just wish everybody did that because, you know, our oceans are suffering. So. Well, great message there to get that out there. And yeah, I know, um, you know, when everything shut down and they said, okay, it's going to be to go only. I know folks were scrambling to do the best that they can, but um, a great message there on what you guys are doing. Um, and hopefully others are, are listening because um, I agree with you there. Yeah. Protecting those oceans. Um, not, you talked a little bit about this at the end. Um, you know, I know I love the, um, the quote and the, and the picture, you know, fork in the road, just take it. Um, and what are some other innovative ways that you've shifted your business or even your priorities at, at Primal Alchemy and, and going forward now that you've got a little bit of insight of what you think the guidelines are going to be? Um, how is that going to change um, your company, if at all? Well, I think that that 
we're going to need to continue being innovators on how to to make events impactful and and memorable for people you know if if there's if there's a wedding and some people in person and having a reception and some people are online from from new york you know and they want us to ship a box of beautiful food to them we can do that you know there's there's some crazy things that we've learned in it through ad adapting to this and, and being innovative and creative and and uh and and just making it happen no matter what i think that that for me also i'm kind of the person that's like that that's why that done is better than perfect just just do it and and be willing to take the risk to figure it out along the way. If it's not perfect, at least you're you're moving forward. You're you're going somewhere and not just sitting in stagnant and and letting this this whole experience um, take you down. And there's a lot of companies, there's a lot of catering companies across this country that are gone and they're never coming back. Yeah. So just just being willing to to jump off that cliff, not knowing where you're going to land. You know, I think that that's a huge. Um, and, and living through it, like hindsight right now, I know I know we're going to be here. So that's a huge boost to the confidence of my employees and myself and and how we can make this work in the future, too. So. Uh, that's great, Dana. And I, I think and I might butcher this. I think, you know, perfect uh, doesn't need to be the enemy of good. You know, just you know, get it done. And I think you've shown that, um, you know, not here through your presentation, but you've, you've walked your talk. And, and those that haven't visited you yet. Um, down in the, the Belmont uh, Plaza area um, on, along that bike path and you, you are you guys are working uh, extremely hard so we, we appreciate that and uh, I know you're going to stick around uh, through the rest of this presentation here so mm -hmm. if there's any more follow-up questions as we get through the, the rest of the presentation here um, please let us know throw it down in the, the Q&A Dana will stick around to the end here and, and we can wrap up all together and get those uh, questions answered. So thanks, Dana, for your presentation this Thank morning. Thank you very, very much. You bet. I'm gonna shift to our next presenter. Um, very exciting to introduce Ryan Cora, the founder and CEO of Cora, a full service experience and event production company, guided by the mission to build experiences with purpose. This year, COVID-19 challenged Ryan to put his mission into practice like never before. Many of you have attended events in the past that you know has had the Cora stamp of approval and has definitely been uh, engage or involved. After 20 years of building and producing some of the country's most iconic events, such as Coachella, PMP Paris Open, San Diego Comic Con, U.S. Open Championship, Ryan has led a series of pragmatic pivots to keep his team together and the doors open. While other event companies went went virtual or had to close their doors, Ryan fought for a way to bring America back by working the largest COVID-19 testing facility in the nation via his newly found founded company, Lifeline Health Services. The large scale COVID-19 testing site is now open to Inland Empire, providing same day results and has the capacity to test over 40,000 people a month. Additionally, to help Orange County and the Hollywood restaurants keep their patrons safe and their doors open, Cora worked with the city and local business to deliver the most extensive build outs in Southern California, including over 3,600 square feet of level raised decks curated outdoor dining space for Laguna Beaches, Forest Avenue, and Craig's in Hollywood. These strategic initiatives follow Ryan and team's delivery of multiple builds for local hospitals, work with which garnered Ryan's uh, attention for Ryan, excuse me, by Mark Cuban, Rolling Stone, the LA Times, Billboard, and Bloomberg, just to name a few. Ever guided by his mantra, don't be boring. I still have the t-shirt, Ryan. Ryan continues to channel goodness and meaning into everything he builds from festivals and sporting events to testing uh, venues and hospital sites. Before he jumps on and uh, presents here, we're gonna kick it off with a quick video here. Take it away. This Oceanside Verbo is about to become the backdrop for an unforgettable vacation memory. Don't be boring. Don't just build something for the sake of building it, but build it so that it does something in somebody's life. Core Events was building the largest events and experiences in the nation. Music festivals, sporting, red carpet events. It's your five senses. You're smelling, you're hearing, you're listening. That's what live events bring. And then we learned about COVID-19. 
coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. The Coachella Valley Arts and Music Festival has officially been canceled. The concert cancellations have hundreds of cases canceled, canceled or canceled, canceling any gatherings over 100 people. What is an event company without events? It's nothing. We had 180 full-time employees and you start thinking about 180 people and kids and spouses and partners. And I had to lay off a hundred people in a day. There's some sorries that you felt like you could have done something better and this, you're a part of something that you can't control. You also tell people that you're gonna fight. They switch gears over a weekend. You know, you go back and you look at you have this warehouse, you have all this equipment, you have all these trucks, you have all this expertise. What could we be doing? And the first thing we thought is we gotta help possible. I needed 90 days. And in those 90 days, we had to reimagine what we could do. This is not just entertainment. We'll work and help save people's lives. I just always like building experiences, building something that would change someone, that would move someone, that would be incredibly impactful. We're going to deliver the best testing site in the nation. I believe that. We know how to build space. We've met incredible partners in testing. Team is everything. People have purpose inside of them. You just have to go find it. All right. Um, well, thanks for having me, uh, Jeremy and Amanda. Uh, does the chat button work for everyone? Can questions go up onto the chat bar while I'm talking, or is that private? If the uh, folks use the chat box, you should be able to see it. Not a problem. Okay. So I just want to encourage uh, anyone who's on uh, to use the chat box anytime to throw a note in there. I'd be curious if you could tell me what kind of business you're in. Give me a feel of what industry, uh, what business. It's, it helps me begin to really tailor some of my words to uh, maybe what you're dealing with. But, you know, this series on, on resilience and having business resilience. Uh, I'll just be really candid. I, I think a lot of us uh, are talking about um, resilience and we really don't fully uh, understand it yet because so many businesses have been supported by government aid or by government money. And we have PVP and you have these different things. And so how resilient really can your business be without that aid? And, you know, in this time of COVID, you, you see industries that were doing terrible and now they're doing good and you see industries that were doing good and they're now doing bad. And there's this, just this total mix up of confusion. And how do I uh, lead or how do you, how do we create businesses that are resilient through all kinds of different weather? And I think right now, so many people are saying my business feels resilient, but a lot of that resilience has come with aid. And I think I would wanna rip off the Band-Aid, if you will, and say, what do businesses look like a year from now, two years from now, if you forecast it out, have you created a business that can handle all of the different waters that are out there and as a CEO or a business leader, it's, it's your job to, to do that. You have to, if you kind of, no one could have predicted COVID or had seen COVID, but in reality, you have to be prepared for the worst in your business. And the opposite of resilience is, is resignation or to resign, to give up and quit. And it was so great to hear from Dana that somebody in this, in this uh, driving back from Las Vegas could have just 
resign, quit, forget it. This is gonna be too much work. But, but they weren't, they were resilient. And I love hearing about businesses and working with people in this time that really had have this attitude of resilience because first and foremost, resilience is a choice. I'm going to choose to be resilient. Uh, the definition of resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from, from difficulties. In my career, um, I, I feel like I've had so many different moments of difficulty, whether that was closing my first big sale or dealing you know, with a lawsuit or trying to handle growth through uh, cash or uh, working um, with a, a new employee that I knew was great, but I didn't know how to get them in the right perfect spot. And uh, you have difficulties in your business. Um, I don't think uh, a lot of people um, could have predicted the difficulties that they've probably faced over the last 12 months. But what I would say is I don't think most businesses are prepared to handle the next 12. I think 21 is going to be far worse for a lot of businesses than 20 were. And 22 is even going to be more because they really haven't um, adapted a resilient plan. So here are four things that I would want each of you to think about in regards to developing your business to being more resilient. The first one, I already said, I think uh, resilience is a choice. First, it starts with attitude, mindset. I can overcome this. I can do this. I, I can figure this out. Um, but in regards to the capacity to recover is what I would first say is, uh, do you have the ability? Are you prepared? You know, are you, um, are you more prepared than your competitor? Are you more prepared um, than other people within your industry? Are you, are you working on your ability or are you complacent? Again, one is resilience, was it? One is resignation. I think this, this, this idea of ability is something that has to be developed, like not giving up continuing to push your ability, uh, developing new muscle. That would be one ability. Uh, number two would, would be understanding uh, your maximums, like understanding what can my business do and what can't it do? So many people go out and they try to be everything to everyone. And so why they can't be resilient is because they're spread out, they're too thin. They haven't really determined what they're great at. What's the one thing that everyone is going to remember about you? And so when, when they get um, you know, tossed around, they don't know how to get up and get back to their core strength. And in our case, our core strength was building. And so when events shut down, we began to build hospitals. We began to build testing centers. We took our core capacity and understanding what our core capacity was. And we just put it into new places in where people wanted to buy something. Um, don't forget that at the end of the day, if you're not concerned with money coming into the door, actually providing a service, providing a solution and being paid for that, your business is not going to be resilient. And so again, starts with attitude, moves to ability. Third would be understanding your core capacity. Four would be quality. Is when you think about, um, I don't know, when you think about capacity, think about pouring a, um, pouring a pitcher of water into a glass. And you would say quality, a glass could hold uh, the water that I'm pouring into it. Now imagine, um, pouring something into a plastic cup. How long, um, what kind of qualities does the, does the cup have? And when you think about resilience, I, I think about quality. I think about if somebody really isn't, um, doesn't have a business, doesn't have a product of quality, it's going to be really hard to be resilient because it's going to break apart. And so when we're talking about the qualities of an organization, if the qualities are, of the organization is dysfunction 
or there's internal fighting, uh, or there's, um, there's a lack of clarity around vision, that the quality of that organization to take on that difficult time, they're going to be distracted. Uh, they're going to be tired. Um, in our case, I found um, that our organization got better. Uh, the more difficulty came our way because it really began to showcase our core strengths of being adaptive, creative, um, that we, we could be scrappy and that we were willing to start somewhere and not say, well, we lost everything. No, it was, uh, we understood that, that, that we, we understood the quality of our organization and, and the quality that we, we could produce. So when I think of resilience, um, whether you're a consultant or you're in retail or restaurant or nonprofit or legit, whatever, whatever industry you're in, you are going to face different difficulties throughout your business. And I think the best leaders, the best CEOs, the best business people that I know are always looking ahead because they know they're going to get sideswiped. They know they're going to get punched in the side of their face. And they're thinking about how do I ensure my organization is resilient? And how is it going to take on difficulties? And my belief in that is that you have to do an inventory of yourself and your organization in regards to capacity. Listen, for me, the last 10 months have been absolutely devastating. It took 15 years of, of 15 to 20 years of work and growth and hiring and um, building and investing. And the ocean came up and it, and it destroyed my sandcastle. I lost so much of what I had worked to build. And that is incredibly emotional and that is incredibly devastating. But also in the last you know, year, um, I found a new voice and I found a way to help people in a new way. And I was able to, um, I was able to go to some places in my life that I never thought that I had the capacity to do. And um, it hasn't, I haven't been perfect by any means. Um, but what I have done is I've led our organization um, through this in a really honest and open and uh, I think resilient way. I think people know on my team and the people that I work with, and they know that first my attitude was 100% uh, committed to getting through it and not just getting through it, but by doing good in it. Um, I think that we, you know, we looked at our ability, we looked at our core competencies and, and we evolved, we, we moved through it. So I love, I'd love to actually move to the Q and A quicker than to just continue to talk. And um, again, would answer any and all questions um, that you might have. Ryan, thanks again. Thanks for um, sharing your thoughts with us today and, and how companies, CEOs, owners can continue to move forward. Um, the, the video that kicked this whole, whole thing off, uh, you know, is emotional if you think about it. You know, you, you did a wonderful job with that. And I know that's just a microcosm of other industries out there facing the same thing that you just faced. So again, thank you for today and, and sharing that. Um, I'll kick off some of the Q&A here. Um, I talked about it real brief in your introduction, how you helped um, some small businesses, mainly some restaurants. I uh, want to dig a little bit deeper into that, you know, especially down in Laguna or maybe in Hollywood, how you helped some of these restaurants when you know, they were essentially shuttered um, and the only thing they could do was to go or take away. Um, and then if they were fortunate enough to be in an area where they allowed outdoor uh, dining. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I think there were certain cities that acted quicker than others. There were certain cities that came along businesses and said, you know, we want, we want to help you. I think Laguna Beach was one of the most amazing cities. They acted really quickly, but they needed an expert 
to show them how they would build within compliance of ADA and distancing and et cetera, et cetera. And so we were able to go into Laguna Beach, be a great resource uh, to them. We helped uh, not only with their restaurants, but their retail and, you know, different and being able to display art. And so um, our team uh, did, I thought, a fantastic job in working with all the different, uh, representing all the different businesses. And, and what I thought they did is, uh, gosh, I don't want to name, there's another beach town close to us that they took their main street and they let people build all kinds of things. And there's pop-up tents and there's, you know, uh, terrible railing and all these things. And, and it really didn't look like a destination. It looked rough. And why would I want to go there? And what I think, what I love about what Laguna Beach did is they committed to building something that was, that was to code and uh, was to safe and responsible, but it was also to beauty and it looked great. And it was nice to assist them and to watch those businesses um, actually do more business than they were doing before is awesome. Wow. No, yeah. that's great. And, and that's sticking with your, um, some of your mantra, you know, that experience matters, right? You know, it's not just about, you know, the, the food and the place you're going to, it's to having that entire experience. And like you said, if, um, if it's not a place you want to go to, how are those businesses going to survive, uh, especially given the, the difficult time that we're in? I'm going to invite uh, Dana to join us back uh, here shortly as she logs back on, but I know we've got a couple more questions for you here, uh, Ryan. And again, uh, um, as we get through these, if you've got a question, use that Q&A feature in the, the bottom there, and then I'll help um, go through these here. Um, you mentioned Lifeline Health, um, you know, in the beginning and how you pivoted to helping hospitals. But then, of course, you know, the COVID testing, especially in the early days when nobody knew how to go get tested or what that was all about. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I met a doctor in the Westminster Mall uh, there were about 400 cars backed up, uh, Dr. Matt Avenante, and, and I went down there and my, my friend actually said, you've got to come see this. So I went down there, I saw these cars, people are using the restroom and the bushes. And I mean, it was just, the COVID, nobody really knew uh, the extent of COVID. And I said to him, I said, you've got to let me help you build this. I mean, we could help move cars quicker. We could do more tests in a day. Uh, we could really help be a solution to uh, helping people understand where they are COVID. And so that led to the creation of Lifeline Health. And uh, we were, Lifeline Health was, um, it was awesome. We got to be about, to be a part of about 140,000 vaccinations. Uh, what some of our busiest time period was the holidays and where people were trying to go see family members and they didn't know where they stood in regards to a COVID test. We were able to provide you know, cities had these COVID testing centers and you get tested and you wouldn't find out your result for five, six, seven, eight days. You would find out a result within an hour. Um, it was safe, it was quick. And, and we utilized our event knowledge to build these things. And so um, Lifeline is now transitioning and it's working with stadiums and venues to help reopen and with protocols. And Dana's right. When she talks about the in industry, the event industry, having a very confusing path back, you know, where is the dartboard? Where is the center? What can we do? What can't we do? And a lot of the reason why this is, is because uh, the event industry, um, they've been overlooked, candidly. They've been absolutely overlooked in regards to all this. You have a stadium uh, SoFi Stadium, five and a half billion dollar investment. And they don't know how to put people in it yet. And that's a problem. Some of those are political problems. Some of those, again, I would want to be really candid. When you are receiving government aid and you are receiving PPP money, it's very hard to understand how resilient your business can be. If you did not do PPP, I can't think of an event company, a restaurant, et cetera, et cetera, that would have been able to survive. I mean, there wouldn't be any. And so we were thankful for government aid, but the reality is government aid is gonna go away and these businesses, if they don't have clear guidelines and they don't have a clear picture on 
how to return, there's not going to be those companies. Oh, excellent point. And so the uh, another uh, maybe towards the end here, final question, but to both of you, um, and you talked about it a little bit here briefly. We we know there this discussion of new guidelines is coming. You know, they at least announced some of it uh, last week. But if you were to look in your crystal ball, both uh, you, Ryan, and, and Dana, and Dana will go to you, and then Ryan will go back to you. What are your thoughts on future live events post pandemic? What's that going to look like? Well, um, I think that that it's it's just going to be it's going to be an interesting combination of of hybrid. I really think that hybrid is going to be huge. Um, that's not going to go away. It's just too advantageous. Uh, the the positives of a, of, a, of online events um, have have been striking. And I think that, that the internet and online is not gonna go anywhere. I think that when, you know, like Ryan does Coachella, I think that things like that are gonna be, because it's a younger crowd, they're not afraid. I think those are gonna, those are gonna go back to where they were. I don't know how long that's gonna take though, because there's, there's such a huge uh, elephant in the room of liability, you know? And we don't know, uh, I have a friend in Maine, small, you know, state that it is, but it's still a billion dollar events industry. He found out yesterday, the day before yesterday, that the liability is going to fall on the venues and the caterers and the event planners and not on the host of the, of the event. Mm. So that's, that puts a lot of onus onto those of us who like, how's that going to be implemented and, and, and what does it do to insurance? And, and, and then you have the fear factor of people who just don't want to go out so it, it's going to be an interesting i don't know it's, it's another one of those forks in the road right ryan like we're we don't know we, we've been, we've just been trying to you know stay 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 around to see what happens so um the guidelines we have we ha they have released occupancy guidelines but they have not released the guidelines of what this is moving forward so uh yeah it's still it's still an unknown path um what do you think ryan um, yeah, first, I think, you know, on the, we do a lot in music festivals and in sports and things like that. And I think candidly, the first thing, big events are going to move where it's easiest and cheapest to do a large event. So you're going to see large events move out of California. It's just, uh, it's, it's just so difficult. And so wherever you are on the political spectrum, it, it doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that there are politics that are influencing the ability to regather. And so I think big events move to states that are easier to work with, cheaper uh, to work with. Um, I love the conversation about liability um, because I think that uh, that's the next chapter of this, right? Lawyers getting involved. I got COVID at this event. Who was responsible? Bum, 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 all that. So what do I think the future is? I think the future candidly um, is very unknown. Um, people are going to gather, like look at churches. Churches have, haven't stopped meeting. I mean, there's churches that on Easter had four or 5,000 people at them. And they did it in a really nice job. I, I, I you know, I, some of them we supported by building some things for them and they distanced. But what I'm saying is, at the end of the day, an event does not occur without somebody taking a risk. Somebody's going to need to take a risk. And who will be the first to really do that and do it the right way will, will probably be the ones to set the tone for what, what a comeback looks like. You guys, excellent points there. And we're going to, we're going to hold it there. We're almost at our one hour mark here. Um, you've given a lot, um, a lot of myself uh, to think about in terms of the liability piece uh, as you both know, uh, heavily involved at the local, state, and federal levels of government in terms of advocating for our members and for businesses. And I think you guys hit on some excellent points regarding liability, especially in your industries as we try to bring these events back. So that's something that we're definitely interested in taking a, a closer look at it because um, yeah, if events are starting to move out of California, like you uh, potentially said, uh, Ryan, yeah, that's something that we're concerned with because we already see things moving out outside of California. So we need to put a stop to that. So we're going to end it there. If you've got other questions or follow-ups, 
please let us know. We'll get those to Ryan and Dana. I can't thank you enough, Ryan and Dana, for presenting today and offering your expertise and, and a little bit of insight of how you got through last year, how you pivoted that, that wonderful word that we thought we were going to leave in 2020, but we're going to continue to pivot in 2021. And then what you guys are looking forward to in 2021. I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of what resiliency means. Um, and that's the reason why we're doing these webinar series is just to kind of shed light on that a little bit and where the chamber can help play a role in that. I wanna thank you all again for joining today's webinar. I wanna give a big, another big thank you to Don Temple Storage, our webinar sponsor um, of the series. We can't do it without them. And of course, a big thank you to SoCal Gas, Valero, Watson Land Company, Dignity Health St. Mary Medical Center for being our top sponsors and bringing this webinar series to you all. If again, you have questions, let us know in the future chat feature, we'll get back to you and we'll follow up. Um, as a reminder, we'll be sending out a recap uh, of this presentation today via our multiple, uh, multiple social media channels. And again, to the email directly to the registrants and the attendees on today's uh, webinar. And we also wanna invite you to attend our final webinar in the three-part series next Thursday at 1030, uh, April 15th. We'll be hearing from Rihanna Nakri, uh, currently our government affairs uh, chair, also our past City National Bank Entrepreneur of the Year honoree, and then of course, um, owner and president of Cambrian Home Care and how she shifted through all of this. You also hear remarks from our current chair of the board, uh, Mitra Rogers. So encourage you to log on and register for that. Again, Jeremy Harris, on behalf of the chamber, our leadership and our members, we thank you for joining us this morning. Have a great rest of the day. I'm looking out the window. It looks like it's a beautiful Chamber of Commerce day. So we appreciate you all. Thank you again. We'll see you next time.